So this morning, you know, I'd like to share a scripture with you. I think, you know, it's one of those scriptures that you have read many times. But, you know, we kind of skip over very quickly. We just skip it over, okay? So here it is, Philippians chapter 2. Amazing chapter. Paul is writing several important scriptures. For those of you who were in the class of hermeneutics, you can begin to, uh, you know, put down the points and you go home and check, you know, if it's according to the hermeneutics, all right, okay? So here it is. It says, now, the one word that is being used here in uh, Greek language, you know, can be translated several different ways. So I'm going to give you two different versions as to what Paul would say there. You or your attitude or among you attitude should be the same as of Christ Jesus or as Christ Jesus had. All right? Your attitude or among you, the attitude among you should be the same than what Jesus had. This is a very incredible statement because, you know, it requires more than what we are willing to give. And so, verse 14, okay? Chapter, uh, second chapter, verse 14. Do all things without complaining and deputing. Wow. That is a heavy one, especially when it comes to complaining. You know how easily we can complain if things don't go our ways, if things are not done in our ways, if things are not done for our ways, you know, then we like to be uh, complainers. Verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among you, you know, who are Christians, you know, you should shine as lights in the world. You know, there is a festival going on or soon to be going on. Uh, it's called what? Lights of? Festival of Lights. You know all about it, especially if you come from the country such as this, right? So all about it. Yesterday, I was just reading in the hotel. They had this, uh, you know, a little uh, saying, a little verse on it you know, as to what the festival of lights or what this whole thing is all about. I was amazed. So then, verse 16, holding fast to the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That means, you know, at the rapture time when Christ returns, that I have not run in vain and labor for nothing. Wow. You see, Apostle Paul was always minded about it because, you know, he says in several different places that I may present you. There's going to be a day coming, you know, the day of Christ, you know, when Christ is going to present, you know, we're going to present something to Christ. And so every pastor, every, you know, uh, responsible person within the church ministry is going to be responsible to present what God has entrusted him with. So Pastor Suresh is going to present this, you know, City Revival Church. He's going to be a presenter of your life and that you may be presented blameless, you know, presented holy, presented perfect, presented no. Uh, built up with all the spiritual gifts, there's going to be a day of presentation. And so he says, you know, that in that day, you know, I may rejoice, not be, you know, happy or sad, you know, or whatever, you know, but rejoice because of what God has done in your life and that has completed the work in you so that you are a fully, complete, mature, mature you know, uh, presented item to Christ. Very interesting. You know, why would Paul always think about it? You see, that's what get, kept him going. Every single day when he was working on the church, every single day when he was ministry, every single day when he was prayer, every single day when he was teaching, it was all to this point here. There was something, you know, as a pivotal point, the end result, you know. That was his aim and his goal that I may present you such as this on the day of his coming. So, how do you achieve that? You achieve the snow by trying to get the church where they ought to be. And so he's talking about attitude. In another scripture, you know, or in another verse, it says, the same word says the mind. You know, you could say, you know, that the mind of Christ be in you as it was in Christ Jesus. But, you know, the attitude is a more specific Greek word, you know, to tell you as to what attitude is all about. And so now when he says this, no, then we have to think about certain things about attitude this morning. What kind of attitude do you have? Someone says, you know, like this, you know, if you go through life with a bad attitude, all right, it's like a flat tire. 
If you go through life with a bad attitude, it's like a flat tire. Why? If you don't change it, you are not going to go anywhere. All right? So that's a pretty much truth, you know. A flat tire doesn't get you anywhere. I had a flat tire once, you know, and I remember that day, this day, got to remember until, you know, Jesus comes. I know what it means. You don't go anywhere. Once you had a flat tire, you know, it was done, finished, it was out, you know, I couldn't move the car anymore. So I had to wait, 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 wait until I changed the tire. And a lot of people think, you know, that they can go with a bad tire, a bad attitude all their life. And they don't realize that they're going to have to change their attitude at some point in time if they were to move on. Patient comes to a doctor, you know, and he looks at him and says, you know what? I have a bad news. Your cancer spread beyond any kind of a repair or healing. So the patient looks at him and says, so how long do I have? And the patient says, well, depends. Uh, the doctor says to the patient, depends on your attitude. Now, that's maybe not totally correct medically, right? But there's some truth in it, right? Depends on your attitude. If you're going to say today, I'm giving up, that's it, finished, I'm dying, you know, might as well not do anything, you know, so but I'm just going to waste away until, you know, I die. Well, that, you know, there's no help for you. But the good attitude helps you, you know, with your sickness, with your cancer. It helps, you know, with things, how you can either recuperate and, you know, maybe more heal than otherwise you would not because of the attitude. And so many people, you know, when they hear something, when there's a problem, you know, when there's something happening in the family, when there's something happening in the church, they develop a bad attitude. And bad attitude is a very, very, very bad thing. And so today, you know, we are thinking about, you know, how can we overcome all these things? You know, Victor uh, Franks, not your pastor Victor, but Victor Franks, uh, he is one of those, uh, you know, survivors from uh, way back, you know, when they were in the German annihilation camp. He says one thing. He says, your success is from shoulders up. That pretty much predict as to what your attitude is. You know, you can do everything else you want to do. But from here on, if those things don't jive, you know, if they're not right, you know, if they're not in correspondence with what needs to happen, you know, you will have never achieved anything as what is, you know, uh, concerning your success. In the beginning... In the early beginnings of childhood, there are several things, you know, that we bring into our life as to what is concerning the attitude. I'm just going to give you a little quote here. Punitive, neurotic, you know, guilt almost always, you know, connects with emotions and are usually referred to uh, psychologists simply as guilt. So they say these feelings based on attitude of self-punishment, self-rejection, and low self-esteem. Just the other day, I had one of the students come to me, and he says, you know, you, want to need, you need to talk to me because I have a very low self-esteem. does not come from God, definitely not. It does not come from psychology. It comes from within you. Okay, people with low self-esteem always suffer a lot of things because they have developed this right from the beginning on. So he says, no, develop over a period of time, you know, within the context of a child's relationship with parents and others. And they say, four dynamics appear to be central in the development. Number one, the child's innate uh, capacity for self-observation and judgment. Number two, for taking you know, in and on others, you know, standards of an exception and, uh, you know, things that they do to you. Thirdly, you know, the taking of and punishment and corrective attitudes from parents or others. You know, how you take this is going to develop your attitude. Fourthly, the child's anger over the frustration of his or her needs and wishes develops an attitude. So there are four components in everyone's life, right from the beginning, when we are children, that we develop certain type of attitudes. And those attitudes are reflections of you know, how you have lived those years before you become a mature person. 
Steve Davis, one of the guys you know, that uh, many times you know, relates to uh, our attitudes or uh, behavioral problems you know, in people, he says like this, attitudes, roots are inward, but its fruit is outward. Always the same. You know, it's right here, but the fruit, you know, what you see, that's outward, okay? Attitude is our best friend or our, best, or our worst enemy. Attitude can be your best friend if it's a good attitude. But if it's a bad attitude, it's your worst enemy. All right? So a lot of people know when they perceive your attitudes, that's where the decision's being made, either you know, for you or against you, either be a friend or not being a friend of yours. Attitude is more honest and more consistent than your words. You, you, you can say whatever you want to say. People watch you. And what you do, your attitude is far more consistent because it's going to be there every single time. Not your words. You can change your words. You can modify. You know, you can talk. You know, you can deceive people, you know, by saying certain things and so on and so forth. But the attitude will display consistency as to who you are in your life. And then it says, you know, like uh, an attitude is a thing, you know, which draws people or repels them. Attitude is never content, you know, unless it is expressed. You know, it's like a little pressure cooker. It'll cook, cook, cook until it's expressed itself. Then you'll know, ah, that's what it is. This is the person. You know, that's, that's an attitude. You know, you, you can hide this for a long time, but one day someplace, somewhere, you know, that thing's going to come off, you know. And then you're going to realize, oh, that's how it is here. <laughs> you didn't know that. Yes, now you know. Attitude is your librarian of the past. It is your speaker of the present, and it is your prophet of your future. Ah, that's it, you know. So um, I hear someone's getting married soon. Not so soon, but soon. All right. So, you know, it's funny. It's the prophet of your life. You know, I had a girl coming in uh, in a counseling, and she says, Pastor, I really love this guy. I said, so what do I need to know that? Oh, I, I just wanted to tell you, I really love this guy. I said, yeah, that's fine. That's good. No, it's good for you because, you know, to me, it doesn't make any difference. It's your life, right? So you're going to marry this guy. So I said, so what do you want to say? She said, well, I, uh, I just wanted to say to you, you know, uh, I love this guy, but... Oh, now it comes, you know. Anytime there is a but, you know, something not so nice is coming. She said, but sometimes he has a very nasty attitude. And when he has it, then I love him even more. I said, girl, are we on the same page? He <laughs> says, Pastor, what do you say to that? I said, I have only one word. Wrong! <laughs> when you have a guy that has a nasty attitude, marriage is not counseling sessions. You're not going to get that man, you know, into a position that this man is going to do anything, you know, more than what he does now. Maybe it's going to get worse, but not better. Henry Ford has a very good attitude. When he was, uh, you know, starting developing cars, you know, and producing cars, he says one thing. I, I like this attitude. Failure is the opportunity to begin more intelligently again next time. Huh? Isn't that nice? We all excuse. <laughs> you know, when you just blow up, you make mistakes, and now you, you, you messed up the things, and they'll say, oh, I'm just going to quote you Henry Ford, no, that this is another opportunity, you know, to start next time more intelligently. It's a nice opportunity, you know, for those, you know, who are still in the process, who are still in the process of developing, you know, whatever they're developing there. So now, the question then is, and you know, we always ask, us, ask ourselves this question is, you know, how do we describe attitude? What is an attitude? You see, we never describe attitude just simply by saying attitude. This is what the attitude is. We always use adjectives, you know, to explain. We never say it just simple, you know, one word, but we use adjectives so that we know and we understand what this is all about, right? So we have 
For example, like a positive attitude. We don't say just attitude, or he has an attitude. No, he has a positive attitude. You want to be around people like this with a positive attitude. You feel good about it. You feel you have a hope and future. You feel like, you know, you're going to make it because these people have a very positive attitude. Those are welcoming people. Those are people that are warm. Those are people, you know, they are forthcoming. These are the people that, that you want to collect as many as you can around yourself and say, well, you know, I'd like to be with these guys or with these people. Leviticus 22 talks about that. But then we have people with a negative attitude. You know, those are the people already pessimists from the beginning on, you know, like they have a lot of flaws in the character and they are very, very negative. Negative, negative, negative. I avoid these people. You know, every time, you know, I would go to church as a pastor. I know several people in our church, you know, they had a very negative attitude. You don't talk to them. Not before the service, not after the service. Sometimes in between Sunday and Friday, maybe, you can talk to them. You lose your anointing when you talk to them. You know, you pray all week long, you know, prepare and pray and pray and pray and prepare, you know. And finally, you know, you get to the church and you walk down the corridor. You don't have a church, but when you have a church, you know, I just walk down the corridor. And that is the person come say, Pastor, I say, later. <laughs> later. We're going to talk later. I didn't say when the later is, just say later, you know. That means, you know, I'm going to pick and choose time when we two of us are going to talk. Because, you know, after you finish talking to them, you're depressed. Then you need to be, go back on your knees and you pray, 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 pray until you recuperate you know, from the negative attitude. There's a lot of people. Like this. And Satan, you know, is smart, you know. He just brings some people into the church with a very negative attitude. How else is he going to do the work? If everybody in church has a positive attitude, then there is no opposition. There is no, you know, kind of a satanic word. So there is few of those, you know, who have given themselves to the service of demons and, her, and Satan to develop very negative attitude, almost like a demonic attitude, you know. And they are just chewing away like cancer, you know, on the body of Christ and always have something, always something, always something. Oh, today this was a very nice service. Oh, what service did you go to? Not my service. You know, negative attitude all the time like this. People like this, you know, don't deserve your time of listening. You know, either they change the tire or, no, they should, uh, you know, stay where they are, you know, because they are just, you know, destroying everything that God has done. But then there's a sour or bitter attitude. You remember Naomi? You know, she felt like, you know, she deserved nothing. She didn't get anything. You know, she has just bad luck kind of thing, you know. So this is what the Bible says, Ruth chapter 1, verse 20, about this sour attitude. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Did he? Did he? You have to look in those things, you know, because you realize, you know, when it comes down to it, you realize, you know, that we put everything to God. Everything to God. My life isn't good. It's God. My life is such a, this God. God did this. God did this. You know, God did this. God made me do this. God did this. You know, and everything's about God. When things are good, we don't mention God. Oh, I'm successful. No. I made this money. No, I got this. No, and I this. And I'm that. No, but when it's bad, it's all God. <laughs> 